Hello and welcome. Um, I just got the sign to start. Um, welcome to You Build It, You Run It, um, where we're going to talk about our hybrid as a service or YAS operational model. Um, my name is René Welches, and in the second part, Johannes will talk about um, how we s use monitoring and logging to support our oper operational model. And we are working on um, hybrid as a service at the side of Cloud Foundry and monitoring and logging. First, some word about Hypris. Um, we're an SAP company since 2013, and our main product is a Hypris Commerce Suite, so we are really focused on e-commerce and commerce products. And so I have to rush a little bit to the slides because um, we only have like 30 minutes. And um, I want to give you a brief overview of what YAS is, or um, better what it's not, because there's always a little bit of confusion about what is Hybris as a service and what, how does it relate to the Commerce as a Service suite. Um, Hybris as a service, or YAS, is not the Hybris Commerce suite. It's not the future of the Commerce suite that we have, and it's new, and it doesn't run on Cloud Foundry, because there was often the questions like, hey, we have customers that are having the Hybris Commerce suite. Does it run in Cloud Foundry? Can we run it on Pivotal's Cloud Foundry? No, we can't. So Hybris as a service is a real new product. So what is Hybris as a Service? Hybris as a Service is a cloud platform that allows everyone to easily develop, intents, extends, and sell services and applications. It's not necessarily restricted to e-commerce. So it's really an open platform. And of course, it's built on microservices. Like you can see here, we have um, core microservices. We have a storefront. We have commerce services mashups. But it's easily to extend. And um, therefore, I I'll, will show you a little bit uh, about the hybrid as a service architecture. Um, on, the, on the bottom, we have an, an infrastructure layer from SAP. And we are running uh, on Cloud Foundry, which is operated by the HANA Cloud Platform team. And what we built on top of this is um, we have core services, which are domain agnostic, like a documentary service for persistence um, or an account service, and on top of these teams build their own domain-specific services like product or cart. And then we have a mashup layer, which I will briefly explain in the next slide. And then we have the connecting um, application clients, which is really interesting for, for you or for anybody that want to use the Hybris as a service platform, is that you can build your own um, domain agnostic or domain specific services like loyalty. So if you go later to the SAP booth, um, I, we, we probably can show you like a loyalty demo case that some of the other SAP teams developed on top of Cloud uh, So Yes, sorry. To the mashups, um, why do we use the mashups? Um, if you don't use mashups, um, the client will always have to implement um, Error logic, handling, requires a lot of calls. And every client has to implement basically the same logic, which can, um, will end up in like a lot of calls to the, to the back end, to the services. And this will also create a lot of network latency. That's why um, we introduced the concept of mashups. And a mashup basically bundles the calls to the back end for, for a client. And the mashup is also there for um, creating resilience. So if one of the back, back services, like let's say the review service is down, the mashup should be so resilient to still send back a result to the client, and the client can handle then the um, output. So much to the, to the architectural background, and now I want to um, go a little bit deeper into the, in what we actually wanted to talk about. It's the you build, you run it paradigm that we have. And um, there I want to start like a little bit in the past. <clears throat> as, as the headline already says, um, experience is what you get when you didn't get what you wanted. And we started our first iteration of, of our software as, uh, as a service approach about four years ago. And um, our first approach had like a couple of flaws, which basically, um, yeah, you can see it as the first iteration. And what we had was um, we had business service teams and core service teams as we have it now. But we had a specific DevOps team which was responsible for packaging the code and 
uh, created Puppet Script and MCOM Collective and was responsible for deploying this to the to a dev environment. So the DevOps team, as soon as it was done with, a, with, with its part, it would hand it over to a so-called team that's called the delivery. And the delivery team was basically responsible to roll that out to stage, test, or prod. And on the other side, we had our infrastructure team, which was basically providing us with uh, virtual machines. Unfortunately, it was not like a real infrastructure as a service. Um, we really had to create and request tickets uh, on tickets-based VMs. And all this um, led to, to uh, a couple of issues or um, w combined with the architecture um, that we had like really long release and deployment size, li uh, life cycles. And if I, if I want to break them down to the architecture and the or or organizational setup, it's um, in the architecture we had, we had already a an, an micro approach, but it was micro applications. Um, they were connected through an SDK, SDK and not a stable API as we have it now. And independent deployments were possible, but you could only release um, the software as a whole package, which ended up in like complex and long-running releases. Um, the architecture also had stickiness, stickiness which means like we had um, session bound to the services and to the applications. So we couldn't use like zero downtime deployment paradigms like blue-green deployment. And everything was only restricted to the Java stack. On the organizational side, I already showed that in the previous slide, we had like this um, separation between operations and delivery. And this um, caused like long deployment and release cycles. That the difference between the development environment, which was handled actually by the development teams, and the test and stage environments, and the production environments, were sometimes like two or three versions behind. So um, there was clearly a, a disconnect between the whole organizations. And one of the, the main factors also was that there was no real infrastructure as a service provider that we could leverage, because we were always depending. We couldn't do like any kind of um, <clears throat> zero downtime deployments, as we saw in the previous talk with Bosch. So what did we change? First of all, we decided we have to go for an infrastructure as a service. Uh, at the beginning, we did that with AWS, because it was the easiest and fastest way to set up. And later, we switched to SAP Monsoon, which is our SAP internal infrastructure as a service provider. This is really essential if you want to use um, a platform as a service like um, Cloud Foundry. And we use this also for um, our backend service deployment, which I will show later. Then we introduced um, a platform as a service. We started with days for prototyping and, and playing around and getting experience, but we pretty soon switched to Cloud Foundry. And this gave our developers basically the freedom to self-deploy and self-operate their services, and also to choose the, the freedom of, of programming language that they want to use. Then we did a lot of changes in the architecture. We introduced um, the paradigms that are given by the 12 factor net. Like one of them is no sticky sessions, restless state. Um, this way we could do blue green deployment for zero downtime. Um, we followed the reactive manifesto for um, resilient services, for example, for scalability. And we started introducing a microservice architecture which resulted like in uh, stable APIs. So we really have um, now stable APIs, and every change to the API um, will reflect in, a, in an increase of a uh, API version number. This all helped us to introduce basically one of our factors, the you build it, you run it. So the d dev team that develops the service also operates the service through all stages, even in production. They deploy it, they, they set up their continuous integration, they set up their, their continuous deployment process. And um, the microservice architecture and the way we use Cloud Foundry enables us to do that, to have independent release and deploy cycles between the services because there is no dependency between the services. And we also extended this whole you build it, you run it paradigm to the backing service. So if a team requires a database for their microservice, they have to operate and deploy this as well. 
So this came then to more or less like a view of this, how we structured our teams. So we have, um, on the bottom, we have core service teams, which um, working on the core teams, and then we have the higher level, the domain-specific teams that build their services on top of these core services. And then we have um, our UI, UX teams, which are currently separated, but I think we're going to move then partly into the teams. Um, I mentioned that also our teams managing their backing service on their own. So in the previous talk, we, we learned that um, in order to deploy Cloud Foundry, you have to use Bosch. And we extended the whole concept to our teams and um, yeah, they're using Bosch as well to manage and maintain their backing services. And what we did is like, um, the microbosh, we have microbosh per team set up, so each team has their own microbosh and can deploy independently from each other, and that's the way how they manage their, um, yeah, their zoo of, of backing services. That's it from my side, and Johannes is going to now tell a little bit how we use monitoring and logging to support our model. Yeah, hello. Is it on? Perfect. Um, yeah, I guess I will skip the introduction of myself because uh, yeah, we planned to. Uh, we, we thought we had 40 minutes, but if 30 minutes. Uh, yeah, well, we have to speed up now. So I'm basically one of the guys living in the dark and doing some computer stuff. So I guess it's basically same, um, same like you. <laughs> If we talk about logging and monitoring in um, microservice architecture, uh, architectures, we are facing a lot of issues or challenges. Um, if we have a look into the old, uh, um, old days, uh, it's really hard to keep an overview of what's basically going on in my system. And in my first employer, I had just had one box. I, if there was something wrong, I had a look at it and could fix it. Now I have to, at least in Cloud Foundry, I don't know how many components are there, about 10. So at least to debug uh, Cloud Foundry itself, it's more like a hell if you do it with a, uh, old school ways. And if we have a look onto our services deployed on top of Cloud Foundry, it's going even worse. Um, on top of that, each team can pick whatever they like to, so they can chain, try it, whichever ever technology they like to use. We're, we got some teams using Go, others are using, a lot of them using Java. Um, I guess somebody is using Akka. I don't, don't even know what it is. So we have to find a way basically to, to monitor and log all this through one single pipeline and to, to somehow Get a, get a similar view on the different technologies. Then there are different app scopes. So let's imagine we have a product service. If you click in your shop, you'll like to see immediately the, the details of a product. On the other hand side, we get some really slow re responding um, services like the checkout service. The checkout service is in the back end checking if your credit card is valid, is you, if your address is correct, um, and so on and so forth. So the checkout service is probably really much slower responding than a fast responding product service. So you can't apply the same rules to each app. And last but not least, you always got some kind of platform influence. So if our infrastructure as a service provider is not going, running well or if we are doing a bad deployment, um, you will see probably on up level some, some influence. And to somehow get all of these different points into to one big overview, we um, sketched out in the first um, draft or in the first try uh, the following architecture. Uh, starting from Cloud Foundry, we are sending metric and event data over to Riemann. And from Riemann, we are starting the alerting. The, uh, we are doing some, some uh, data com combination, check if one service is up, then should the other run as well, and so on. And um, at least alerting the team through Victor Ops and storing all the metric data into Graphite. One of the downsides of Riemann, since an, at least I am not the real big enclosure, it's hard to, to configure it. And um, 
at least it is not really scalable. There is for for Riemann, um, you can program some scaling in there, but it's not really scaling well. On the other hand side, we are uh, running the the lock, uh, locks through a different approach. Um, we are using um, lock stash with the dislock endpoint, where you can um, yeah you can configure in Cloud Foundry the dislock drain URL, sending all the data over to lock stash. Then it's stored or cached in Redis, sent over into a lock stash indexer, and finally. It ends up in Elasticsearch. Mm, that's quite okay, but um, yeah, Logstash is not really comfortable to use like the thing we, we, we are doing now. In October, uh, Cloud Foundry released a new cool feature called the Firehose. So um, this is basically the, the underlying architecture. You get some, some sources where logs are uh, s sent over to the Metron agent installed on the VM. The Metron agents are sh shipping over the, um, the log messages uh, to do Doppler where it's um, buffered. If we, you have configured a syslog drain URL, the, the logs are um, sent to syslog directly. Otherwise, um, the log regator traffic controller is taking care um, that if you, you ask for some logs, you will get them. And um, yeah, that's basically the way how the CF CLI, if you run CF logs, is working. And on a much bigger scale, the firehose is doing the same job. Um, if you request uh, or if you, you connect to the firehose, you will get the logs of the entire system. And one of the main benefits of the, the uh, firehose is it's also scalable. So if you connect different, uh, a client with the same client ID uh, several times, the log messages are um, s spread equally over the whole firehose. And this is a really great thing because now you can can run a small uh, build a small app, deploy it to Cloud Foundry, connect it to the firehose, and if this is not working anymore, you don't have to do a whole Bosch uh, deployment like Cornelia told us. You just have run CF scale, and uh, yeah, you're on on the safe side. What we so what we are currently building based on this this Doppler in mind. Uh, we still have all the, the backing services and the application and uh, Cloud Foundry component logs itself. But what we are doing now, we are sending all these different sources of log information and uh, metrics information into Doppler. Um, just to, as a note at, at this side, um, there is a client available you can, can use to uh, integrate also backing services deployed not into the Cloud Foundry cluster. So. Yeah, that's something we will try out soon. But at least the application logs and Cloud Foundry logs itself are running through Doppler. Um, then we implemented a log parser. That's the thing I described uh, before. So the NOAA client is basically the compon com component uh, Pivotal is providing us to, um, to get the logs out of the fire hose. And we built a um, log parser, which is basically checking which kind of messages message are you, and are you a normal log message, then you will pass with the first rule. If you're um, maybe a router message, you will be passed with the router rule, and um, basically we are distinguishing on up log level between two different um, log types. First, a normal log type where we just get maybe a request ID and so on, and second, we got a metric log type. So we removed this whole Riemann infrastructure. Oh, sorry. And we are now sending over the uh, metric data through logs two. Because in the past, we had the problem that if somebody is using some strange um, programming language or some, some, some unknown um, uh, some, some unknown technology, uh, they probably had to implement by their own the Riemann agent. Basically for standard in and standard, or for standard error and standard out, every programming language is able to lock to standard in, uh, error and standard out. And that was the reason why we decided to send everything through lock messages, just to, uh, that nobody can complain, I don't have a client for this specific monitoring tool. 
From there, we are handing over all the data into a Spark cluster. This is basically done to um, uh, get a replacement for Riemann. Um, Spark itself um, can do the same as Riemann, from my perspective, uh, with the benefit of, of scaling. So now we can, even if there is a huge, uh, huge um, tr uh, traffic on the, in the log system, we can just scale out in Spark and we are done. On the output side, yeah, we are s storing all the data in Elasticsearch where we got, or where the teams can build nice dashboards on top. Um, and the alerting is done through Victor Ops. It's, yeah, kind of pager duty. And, um, yeah, there will be will several more systems con consuming the log data because, yeah, you can do some predictions on top of, um, logging data, for instance, um, you can, yeah, maybe some, some, some customer related data can be fetched there and so on and so forth. If we have a uh, look back to the, to the challenges we fa uh, face in the, uh, on, on the beginning, the overview, yeah, it's still a tricky thing because you don't get this nice UI where you know, okay, here's flowing from here to there. But um, I already mentioned the, the request ID we established in all our services. Um, so if a log message or if somebody is hitting one of our endpoints, this request ID is um, taken through the whole system. And at the end of the day, you can... Um, have a look in uh, Elastic Search for search for this single request ID, and you get in basically all the endpoints this request from the outside um, hit it. Um, maybe some some other yeah part where you can can um, leverage this output thing, things, um, build automatic graphs based on this data. Different technology, I already mentioned, we are shipping everything through locks. So if there is somebody not able to send out locks, he is really for sure not taking the right uh, technology. Different app scopes. In um, Riemann, we had a single Bosch deployment to install Riemann and configure Riemann and so on. With Spark, we are now able to allow teams to deploy their own monitoring rules. And um, hopefully the teams will do this to, to cover their specific needs of monitoring. And the platform in, uh, influence, um, since we get all the log messages about uh, response time, which error codes or which, which HTTP response codes and so on and so forth, um, we are able to, to identify if the whole performance of the, the platform is, is going up or going down. And... Um, so at the end, we really got a good overview, not about specific co components. We can also get a really good overview of the, the entire system. Oh, I was faster than expected. Um, are there questions? Should we do it? Uh, with, with CPU, disk space, and so on and so forth. That's something we like to integrate there too. At the moment, we are, uh, we are doing this uh, with Riemann. There are basically these Riemann health tools. Uh, so maybe I have not mentioned that we are in a transition phase at the moment. So the app logs and metrics are going through the, um, Doppler, uh, through the Doppler approach. The other things are um, partially still going through Riemann. And yeah, we will, uh, there is, I guess, in the NOA project already some sm um, small piece where you can, uh, some example file how to get system metrics through Doppler. But now yeah, that's, I'm not 100% sure. Yeah. Um, you have slides where you show the you move Oh, that's... Um, there's a learning curve. You have developers that manage it 
Um, René, du musst. So, there was a, definitely a learning curve for the teams. But it was interesting. You can find, like, in, in, in almost any team, you can find somebody that, that discovers his, his interest in, in operational tasks. So what we did is, like, because we, we had the Bosch experience, we started, like, kind of one-day workshops with the teams where we told them the basics of Bosch. And from there on, there was, like, one or two guys in each team that was um, taking over the task and, and doing the Bosch deployments and playing around and improving them. Because, for example, for a MongoDB, our team, we didn't have the experience that the developer teams has, like what, what to tweak and how to improve the MongoDB, but these teams had it, and they just had to apply that then to their Bosch deployments. Were most people pretty eager about Bosch? Uh, both, yes and no. <laughs> I guess to, to, to sum it up, you have to automate it somehow. And if you're using Puppet, you have to learn something. And if you're using Bosch, you have to learn something as well. So at the end of the day, we could provide them an in-house workshop where they only have to pay some travel costs instead of hiring somebody from the outside who could do this, for instance. OK. Thank you. Thank you.